This is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to talk about, answer the question, does money printing cause inflation? We've been talking a lot about this guy in the last uh, few videos, how the Federal Reserve is printing a lot of money. And I'm always getting the question, does this cause inflation? Will it cause inflation? If you're interested in learning how the economy actually works, how inflation works, what is actually going to happen to the stock market, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So in my previous video yesterday, we talked a little bit about how the government lies about inflation, the problems with it, especially the problems as related to what's called Goodhart's Law, where when a measure becomes a target, so for example, if you're measuring, if you're measuring inflation and uh, you're sort of trying to target your policy towards, towards this measurement, it ceases to become a good measurement, a good measure. Now, this definitely applies to the consumer price index. It implies to all the inflation numbers as well as money velocity. So if you want that take on it, be sure to watch yesterday's video, which I'll link to, uh, link to below. But for the purposes of this video, we are going to assume that we can basically trust these government statistics, even though there are many, many problems with them. So what is money printing? The way it's really been done in the US over the last 11 years is the Federal Reserve prints new money they increase the money supply. This is the M2 money stock. And they use it to buy assets and put them on their balance sheet. So whenever you see these spikes on this chart, this is the Federal Reserve's assets going up. They've really spiked this year. This is quantitative easing. This is money printing, where we print more money, where the Federal Reserve creates money out of nowhere and uses it to buy treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, corporate bonds. And in the case of Japan, they've actually even been buying stocks. These are the relative numbers. So the first QE happened right after Lehman Brothers failed in September of 2008. And so the first quantitative easing, the Fed printed 1.3 trillion and used it to buy mostly mortgage backs and treasuries to sort of reca recapitalize the US banking system. That's what's called Q QE1, quantitative easing one. And again, quantitative easing is you just print new money and use it to buy assets and hold them on the central bank balance sheet. This was really pioneered by Japan. Then we had another round of quantitative easing called QE2 in 2010 to 2011. Another one in uh, after the European debt crisis uh, in, uh, in uh, 2012 to 2014, that was 1.7 trillion. And then this year, it really began with the repo crisis of the third quarter of 2019, which I've talked about in previous videos. But for, that's when uh, this, this current QE, the people call it QE infinity, uh, started. And basically the Fed has said they're gonna do whatever it takes. So far their balance sheet has grown by 3.3 trillion. So you can see this is uh, much, much more than any of the, the, the previous. We're really in unprecedented uh, territory here. And you can really see it from the, the Fed's balance sheet uh, spiking, especially if we look over the last five years or we look over the last one year. The number is just enormous. We've gone from four trillion to over seven trillion on the balance sheet. Now, what has happened to inflation over that period of time? Because we're trying to answer the question, is money printing inflationary? Inflation as measured by the CPI, and again, there are lots of problems with this index, but we're gonna sort of take it at face value. CPI inflation has been fairly tame since quantitative easing started. Quantitative easing started somewhere around here. And since then, we've really had inflation under 3%. And um, it's actually spent quite a bit of time as well, uh, up until 2015, under even 2%. It's falling off a cliff now because of COVID. These are, um, uh, this is why people say we're in a deflationary period now, which to a certain extent is true when people stop spending when they stay at home, when they stop buying things. This obviously uh, creates a dip in consumer price inflation. So we've had all this quantitative easing. What has happened to inflation? It's been fairly low. It's been fairly muted. And this is why a lot of people say that it is benign, that money printing is benign and does not cause inflation. But if we look at some other charts, we can see that it has had some effects on asset prices. It's had a huge effect on the S&P 500, which has really gone from uh, call it, uh, call it, uh, you know, 700, six, 660, uh, 666, all the way above, above 300. We've had uh, corporate bonds, both junk bonds and investment grade bonds, just go straight up over this period of time. We've had Bitcoin 
uh, go straight up over this period of time. Uh, it's sort of in a sideways period of consolidation here. I would expect it to go higher. And I talk about that in other, in other videos. Gold has obviously moved higher over this time as well. Kind of a similar chart to Bitcoin, which is interesting, on its way to breaking new highs. We've had housing prices go up over this whole period of time. Now, obviously, there was a housing, housing bubble. It popped. We had an economic recovery, so we would expect this. But what we're seeing overall here is we're seeing asset prices rising from real estate to stocks to bonds to gold. Now, this makes sense because when you do quantitative easing, when you do this kind of money printing, the money is printed. It's used to buy treasuries. It's used to buy assets in publicly traded markets. And what this does is it drives up asset prices. But when you look at who owns uh, a lot of the real estate and most of the stocks, especially uh, based on uh, uh, being a percentage of the population and net worth and who, really, where the, who has the concentration of stocks and real estates, it's actually wealthier people. So wealthier people tend to own more stocks. They tend to own their homes. They tend to own second homes and vacation homes and investment properties. And so they benefit from asset prices being driven up by the Fed. So if you print money and you put it into uh, the stock market or you put it into the corporate bond market, you are not going to cause inflation simply because wealthy people are not going to buy uh, when their stock prices go up, when their housing prices go up. They're not going to spend more on eggs. They're not going to spend more on bread. They're not going to spend more on these consumer items. What, what wealthy people tend to do is the more money they get, the more stocks they buy, the more their wealth is concentrated in assets. And because they tend not to, if you have $100 billion, there's only so much you can spend. You can, um, and you tend to, to spend it on investment items like maybe a, a nice house in Hawaii on the beach, etc. But you're not going to be driving up consumer prices with it. You don't need to really buy anything else. You're already very wealthy. And so what happens is the velocity of money goes down. All this money gets printed. The velocity of money is basically just how many times a dollar is spent in a year. It's essentially GDP divided by the money supply. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, the quantity theory of money. But we can basically see that over the last 10 years, monetary velocity, the velocity of the M2 money stock, has gone off a cliff. It's just gone down and down and down. Now, this makes sense because the money that's being printed is ending up in rich people's brokerage accounts and in their houses. It's not really circulating through the economy. Again, there, there, are, there are a lot of problems with, with all of these measurements because of the Goodhart, Goodhart's law. But just taking them at face value, this is what we would expect if the money was not being circulated through the economy. It was basically being concentrated in the hands of wealthy people who are getting richer and richer because of the central bank policy. And again, the central bank is run by ex-private equity investment banker types like Jerome Powell, who only care about the rich people and their policies for the most part, have just benefited wealthy people over the last 10 years. So money printing has not caused inflation because of where it's been injected in the economy. It's been injected into asset prices. But this may be beginning to change. So just briefly, uh, I wanted to show you guys the quantity theory of money equation, which is just the money supply times monetary velocity is equal to nominal GDP. Uh, which is basically all the goods and services that are produced every year in the U.S. Nominal GDP can be broken down into some inflation rate times real GDP or uh, kind of inflation-adjusted GDP. If you took Econ 1, you probably remember this equation. There are various versions of it, but it's uh, sort of an identity, sort of by definition. And as such, it's not necessarily debatable. debatable. But one way to look at this is if... Uh, if the money goes into asset prices, as we said, what you would expect is the money supply goes up, so M goes up, V goes down, and as a result, you don't get P going up. You don't get inflation going up. And so, as we said, when the money, newly printed money goes into asset prices, you don't really get consumer price inflation because rich people, how many desktops or laptops or how many eggs can they eat in a week or bread? Now, they may buy, be buying gold, uh, types of bread that are made from gold or made from champagne, as we've alluded to in different videos, but you don't get a lot of consumer 
price inflation. Now, of course, the CPI is being managed. It's a measurement that's being managed, so there may be problems with it. But on the surface of it, this sort of makes sense. And so this is quantitative easing. This is where you inject money uh, from the central bank and you basically give it to wealthy people. It causes a lot of wealth inequality and it causes uh, contributes to the sort of social unrest we've been seeing in the last year. Now, what happens if instead of printing the money and putting it into asset prices, you actually send checks to people? Now, this is often called UBI, universal basic income. Some people call it helicopter money. Uh, you, could, you could say quantitative easing is helicopter money for the rich. UBI checks are, quantita are, UBI checks are helicopter money for the middle and working classes. Now, my theory is that if we see uh, this money printing going much more into checks that are sent out to people. We had a $1,200 check that went out in the U.S. for people in certain certain income brackets as kind of a substitute for, um, for uh, a salary with the economy being shut down because of COVID. This was sort of the, one of the first examples we have of UBI in the U.S. We had something similar, I believe, happened after, after uh, September 11th. We had some checks that went out and the same happened in uh, early in Obama's first uh, first term. Uh, but basically, we're moving much more toward UP, UBI or helicopter money for the working class and the middle class simply because if we continue to prop up asset prices, it creates a lot of wealth inequality, a lot of social tension. And so what I would expect is that the more the Fed prints money now, the more it's going to end up, especially if we really start UBI at the national level in the U.S., where every household um, say every household below $100,000 income gets a $2,000 check per month. This would basically be taking money that's created out of nowhere by the Fed and instead of injecting it into asset prices, injecting it into the real economy, sending people debit cards, sending uh, depositing money directly into people's bank accounts. And if this happens, it's going to be very difficult for it to go away. Once people uh, become reliant on free money, checks from the government, they don't want it to go away. And if you're a politician who wants to run against this, you'll never be elected. If you are a, a, a politician who's currently in office and you try to get rid of these UBI checks, you'll be voted out very quickly. So there's a tendency for once government programs are instituted for them never again to go away. But I would suggest that UBI is on its way. It's very close. We may see it in the next administration, whether that administration is Republican or Democrat. We certainly had a form of UBI checks even under a Republican like Trump about a month and a half ago. Um, but I think at this point, the Fed is going to have to print money, use it to continue to prop up asset prices like the S&P 500, and also send it over the tre to the Treasury, uh, to the U.S. Treasury, send it who sends it to Congress or to whom, whomever, and send it out to the general population, especially the middle and working classes who have really been slammed even much harder by the COVID crisis and by loss of jobs, etc. And this means that even though money printing has not been very inflationary, at least according to the official statistics over the last 10 years, we might expect going forward for it to become increasingly inflationary, which means that asset prices like uh, gold and Bitcoin, and to a lesser extent, stocks, should continue to do really well. I'm especially bullish on gold and Bitcoin for this reason, because this new helicopter money is going to be going into people's pockets. They will be spending it, and it's not just going to be sitting inside of stocks in wealthy people's brokerage accounts. If you found this video helpful, let me uh, uh, let me know your questions and comments. Hit that subscribe and like button, and uh, let me know your suggestions for my next video as well. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.